Welcome to Australia. This is Koenyama. It is a remote place, not even a place really, in uh, northern Queensland. And uh, here today, on the 10th of May 2013, we're going to have the privilege of experiencing an annular solar eclipse. Now you will not see this many other places because this particular eclipse is visible mostly across the ocean and in fairly inaccessible areas. So this may be one of the only videos that you can actually experience this uh, May 10th, 2013 annular solar eclipse. The pictures that you are about to see of this annular solar eclipse from Australia, we're, going, we're taking with a Canon DSLR camera hooked up with a Smith Cassegrain telescope which is complete with a homemade uh, sun filter on the front so that we won't destroy the camera and the telescope. Today we are going to see a solar eclipse. Now we understand that uh, the solar eclipses are caused by the moon coming in front of the sun. It's a very uh, widely accepted explanation of the cause of a solar eclipse. And it's a very reasonable explanation because the moon and the sun are in the same position in the sky at this particular moment. And we see something come in front of the sun, a big black circle. And we know that the moon is a quarter of a million miles away. And we know that the sun is 93 million miles away. And we know the moon is very small and the sun is very big. So we assume, of course, naturally, that by some fluke of the creation of the universe, the moon happens to be just the right size to cover the sun. It's all very reasonable. Anyway, today, what we're going to see is an annular solar eclipse. This means that the moon is going to come in front of the sun, but it will not be big enough to cover the whole sun, as we see in a, a total solar eclipse. So we're going to see the moon uh, come in to the sun and cover it, and then it will gradually come out the other side. Now you may ask, what is a Hare Krishna devotee doing interested in a solar eclipse? Well, I have become curious because, you know, we in the West, we know it very clearly. We've, we're very convinced that we understand what's happening when we look in the sky and see this solar eclipse. However, when we read the Vedic scriptures, we find a very different explanation of what's happening during the time of a solar eclipse. And for me that is perplexing because the Vedic scriptures are timeless. They've existed for thousands and thousands and actually hundreds of thousands and millions of years. And they contain scientific knowledge. And what's more, in the field of astrology and astronomy. They contain models of the universe which are actual calculation models which enable the sages and saints of the past ages to very expertly calculate uh, in minute detail all of the movements of the heavenly bodies. So in India, great sages and sadhus have been able to calculate the exact moment of the solar and lunar eclipses uh, down to a tiny fraction of a second. Even 5,000 years ago, even 10,000 years ago, even 20,000 years ago. Now in contrast, our modern astronomers have only been able to do these things in the past 50 or 100 years. So we're looking at a culture that has a vast uh, history are successful astronomical calculations. We're looking at the culture that invented mathematics, that invented trigonometry, that invented the decimal numbering system, that invented zero. 
that invented sine, cos, tan. These things are all invented in India. We say invented, but they're not really invented. They're knowledge, they're Veda. They're information which is given to us in the Vedas. So now we have a storehouse of knowledge which undoubtedly and unquestionably contains huge amounts of valid scientific knowledge. But in the middle of all of this, we have a description of the cause of the solar and lunar eclipses, which is so dramatically different from what we accept uh, as happening that, that it makes one wonder. Now, according to the Vedic understanding, what causes the solar and lunar eclipses is a dark planet by the name of Rahu. And that planet has the ability to occult or to cover the sun and the moon. Now, according to this Vedic model, it's completely different from our Western model. The Earth is here in the Vedic model. Then the nearby, the nearest planet is Rahu. Then beyond Rahu, there is the sun. And beyond the sun, there is the moon. So we have like this Earth, Rahu, sun, moon. So it's not actually possible, according to the Vedas, for the moon to come in front of the sun. Because the moon is beyond the sun. I'm just telling you the model. Now according to the Vedic understanding, what happens at the time of a solar eclipse is that this planet Rahu comes in front of the uh, sun. And behind the sun there is the moon. So we think actually it's the moon coming in front of the sun. Whereas in reality it's Rahu, which we don't even know exists, coming in front of the sun, which causes a solar eclipse. In this universe, there are always uh, two different types of uh, living entities. There are the godly or saintly people, they are called the demigods. And there are the demoniac, uh, sinful people, they are called asuras or demons. So there was a time thousands and thousands of years ago when both the demigods and the demons cooperated together with one object. They wanted to produce nectar by churning the ocean. Now, we can understand if we're doing some chemical experiment in the laboratory, we take some test tubes and we mix the different chemicals together and that produces some reaction. Now, the demigods, they wanted to do this on a grand scale. They wanted to use the ocean as their test tube and they wanted to put various ingredients into the ocean and mix it and churn it. And then they required a, a churning rod, uh, something to stir up the ocean because once all of the ingredients had been placed into the ocean, they needed to agitate the ocean. They took a great mountain and they took that mountain into the ocean and uh, they had no way of uh, uh, churning, moving the mountain around. So they took the uh, advice of Lord Vishnu, who suggested that Vasuki, a great serpent, could be used as the churning rod. Demons on the head and the demigods on the tail took this huge serpent, wrapped it around the mountain and used that uh, by pulling it different directions. The mountain started to churn the ocean. But unfortunately, uh, because there was no firm rest for the mountain, it started to dig into the bottom of the ocean and became stuck there. So there was a need uh, for some pivot, something which the demigods and the demons could use to uh, balance the mountain on in the bottom of the ocean and so they could continue their churning successfully. So they prayed to Lord Vishnu and Lord Vishnu most uh, mercifully appeared as an incarnation. That incarnation is called the Korma Avatar. Lord Vishnu, in the form of Korma, is an enormous tortoise uh, with a huge back and a huge shell. So he sat in the bottom of the ocean and took the, the, the mountain on his back. And he was feeling some itching sensation. So when the demigods and the demons resumed their churning of the ocean, the uh, point of the mountain was nicely scratching the back of Korma, the tortoise incarnation of Lord Vishnu. 
So just see how wonderful uh, the Lord is. The demigods and the demons were frustrated in their attempts at churning the ocean. And the Lord very mercifully appears as a, as a tortoise incarnation to, to successfully churn the ocean. It's becoming quite eerily dark, dim now that the sun has been eaten up so much uh, in this eclipse. It's 8.32 now and we're going to see the maximum at 8.47. So that's a few minutes and we shall see what happens. During an annular solar eclipse, it's not possible for the uh, sun to be completely covered. So we will see that there will be a border around uh, the, the, well, we say the moon, but we think it might be Rahu. And uh, we, we'll see. So we won't become completely dark. There will be, most of the sun will be covered, but we will, remaining, there will be a ring around the outside of the sun. So back to the story about the churning of the ocean. The purpose of the churning of the ocean was to produce nectar. And the demigods and demons were successful and produced the nectar, which was able to give immortality. So after the churning was finished, uh, the demons and demigods all sat down together uh, to distribute the nectar. So this became a little bit of a problem uh, because the demons are very bad and it would not be good for them to have the nectar because they will do all sorts of terrible things. So Krishna appeared as a beautiful woman, Mohini Murti, and he did that because demons uh, they're attracted very much by the beauty of a woman. So when the demons see a beautiful woman, they become completely overwhelmed. And they'll do anything that that woman tells them to do. Wow. Now we see it's coming close. We see uh, the ring around the, the moon. Now it's not dark. It's not like... Uh, dark like a uh, uh, full eclipse. We can still see everything quite clearly, but you can see that so much of the sun's lo sun has been blocked out. Anyway, Mohini Murti and the demigods. So the demons are very attracted by beautiful women. And uh, so naturally Lord Vishnu decided to appear as a beautiful woman. So he could bewilder them. Because Lord Vishnu's plan was that he didn't want actually the demons to take the nectar. He only wanted the demigods, the godly, saintly persons to take the nectar and become immortal. So Lord Vishnu in the form of this beautiful woman, Mohini Murti, had all of the demigods sit in a line on one side and all of the demons sit in a line on the other. Then Mohini Murti went to the demons and smiled very beautifully at them and spoke to them very sweetly and said, well, of course, I'm going to give you all of the nectar, but first I must go over there to the, uh, to the demigods and just out of uh, formality, I will do, give them a little bit. Hmm. So most of the demons were completely bewildered by this trick of Mohini Murti. But there was one demon there his name was Rahu, and he could understand what was happening. He knew what Lord Vishnu was trying to do. He knew that in the, in the guise of uh, placating the demigods, actually Lord Vishnu was going to give them all the nectar, and there would be nothing left for the demons. So this Rahu is very intelligent. Oh my God, look at that. Oh, look at that. We have the sun. Uh, now completely covered by the moon, and we have simply a ring outside. This is amazing. So the moon or Rahu, whatever it is, it's too far away from the earth, so now it's not able to completely cover the sun. Isn't that beautiful? And now the totality is finished, and we see the moon is coming out the other side, or Rahu, whatever you think. And still we, we can't really tell if it's the moon or Rahu because we just know some black circular thing has come in front of the sun. And it could be Rahu and it could be the moon. We, we, we really don't know for sure at this point in time. Anyway, we should continue our discussion 
of Mohini Murti and her trick. Mohini Murti was trying to trick the demons into thinking that she was only going to give the demigods one, two drops of the nectar and she would keep everything for them. But there was one demon by the name of Rahu who understood this trick of Mohini Murti. And this Rahu decided to sit in the line of the demigods. Of course, he could not, he had to disguise himself. So he dressed himself up as a demigod and sat in the line with the demigods. And he actually sat next to the sun and the moon in that line, between the sun and the moon. Uh, and uh, because every uh, planet has a demigod, so the sun has a demigod, the moon has a demigod. So Rahu sat between the sun and the moon. And Mohini Murti was going along the line and distributing nectar to all of the demigods. And she came to Rahu and uh, he took the, the cup of nectar and some drops of the nectar went into his mouth. But then Mohini Murti realized, oh, this is not a demigod. This is Rahu. This is a demon who sat in the line to trick us. So immediately Mohini Murti took the Sudarshan Chakra, the weapon of Vishnu, and chopped the head of Rahu off completely. But what had happened is that the nectar was not able to go down into the Rahu's body, but the nectar was in his, his head, mouth. So the head of Rahu became eternal. The body was finished because the head was chopped off, but the head, because of the nectar in the head, became eternal. So that Rahu's head became the, the planet Rahu. And uh, because he was sitting bet bet between the sun and the moon at that time when the nectar was being distributed, Rahu is inimical uh, to the sun and the moon. So whenever Rahu gets an opportunity, he tries to attack the sun and the moon. So this uh, time when there is no moon is an opportunity which Rahu takes to attack the sun. So what we are seeing now is actually an attack by a demon on the sun who is a demigod. So this is a very inauspicious moment. So now you understand the story of how Rahu, the planet, this black planet, which has a tendency to attack the sun and the moon, has come into existence. It may surprise you to uh, know that in India, they are actually very expert at calculating things like the occurrence of the solar and lunar eclipses. And they have been very expert in this science for thousands and thousands of years. And uh, this science, their understanding of the universe is based on uh, conceptions which are vastly different from those that we accept in modern astronomy. So, even if we believe everything about modern astronomy is correct, at least we have to accept that the model of the universe, which is uh, uh, given by the great sages in the ancient Vedic scriptures, is actually a valid predictive model. Because using the model of the universe, which is there in the Vedas, the great sages and sadhus have been able to predict things like solar and lunar eclipses long, long before anybody in the Western world even existed. <laughs> Certainly long before science and technology existed in the Western world. The sadhus in India were able to calculate these occurrences, astrological phenomena, with incredible accuracy. So it is probably worth considering there may be some validity in the Vedic model of the universe. And really that is my interest here. My interest is to come to some understanding of the Vedic model and its apparent inconsistencies with the Western model. And I've, I've come to accept now that what we have in astronomy in the Western world is nothing more than a predictive model. We have uh, created a model of the universe and it predicts quite accurately many of the phenomena that we see occurring in the sky. So to the degree to which it, a model 
accurately predicts things, then we, we, we get faith in that model. But it is possible that the universal situation may be different from our model. There are two ways of acquiring knowledge. One is uh, the ascending process and one is the descending process. So ascending process of acquiring knowledge means trying to discover that knowledge yourself. This is basically the scientific process. That is the process of uh, observation and experiment. So the scientists observe something, they make a theory, they make an experiment, they prove their theory, and in this way, by their own power, by their own strength, they come up with some knowledge. That is okay, of course, but every person is imperfect. We all share four defects, four fatal flaws, which uh, make every piece of knowledge which we discover through the ascending process imperfect. We have imperfect senses. It means that when I look at something in the sky with my eyes, I'm not seeing what's in the sky. My eyes are imperfect. There are so many things in the sky I can't see uh, because the instrument which I'm using is incapable of detecting them. So because my instrument with which I'm acquiring knowledge is imperfect, then the knowledge which I'm going to generate in, from that observation will by definition be imperfect. So we have imperfect senses. We have the, the tendency to cheat. Everybody has their own pet theory. And when even scientists, they're trying to establish something, they want to establish their particular idea, their particular theory. So the tendency is to accept evidence that supports their theory and to reject or hide evidence that goes against their theory. This is ingrained within every person, the tendency to cheat. So there's two things. We have the tendency to cheat and we have imperfect senses. Also, every person makes mistakes. Uh, there is no exception to this rule. So we make mistakes. So somebody who makes mistakes cannot produce perfect knowledge. So we have imperfect senses, we have a tendency to cheat, and we make mistakes. And we're illusioned. Every person is illusioned. It means he accepts something to be a fact which is not a fact. And science is such a perfect example of this illusion. In science there are so many fundamental principles which are not true. You know, we take uh, biology or anthropology, the fundamental principle they more or less assume is life comes from chemicals. That by some random combination of chemicals, uh, the living force has come into existence. But this is completely false. Actually, the living force and chemicals are two completely separate things. So this is an example of being illusioned. So someone who is illusioned like that can never have perfect knowledge. So every scientist uh, is full of these four defects. They all are illusioned, they have imperfect senses, they cheat and they make mistakes. So with all of these flaws, they cannot produce any perfect knowledge. This means the ascending process of knowledge is useless. Because any knowledge which is produced through the ascending process is by nature flawed, imperfect. So what does that leave us with? That leaves us with the descending process of knowledge. The descending process means accepting knowledge from an authority. 
If you can find somebody who knows a particular science, you can learn that science from him. And if he has perfect knowledge, then he can transmit perfect knowledge to you. This process is called shruti or hearing. If I'm fortunate enough to have a perfect uh, authority, a perfect person whom I can hear from, then that person can give me perfect knowledge. So the Vedas uh, is perfect knowledge. Veda means Avaroha Panta. It means the Vedic knowledge was not produced by human brains. The Vedic knowledge is not a product of human manufacturing. It is a knowledge which has descended from a higher source. Knowledge which has come into the material world from the spiritual world. Every scientist has these four flaws. Every scientist makes mistakes. Every scientist is illusioned. Every scientist cheats. And every scientist has imperfect senses. So every piece of scientific knowledge is completely flawed because it is produced by scientists who all have these flaws. So what is the alternative if we cannot trust the knowledge which has been produced by observations through our senses? It means we have to find knowledge from a perfect authority. That is the only way we can get perfect knowledge. So fortunately for us, a Vedic knowledge is there and that contains all, all knowledge. Veda means knowledge. So anything which is knowledge, we can find that in the Vedas. So there is uh, uh, astrological knowledge in the Vedas. There is medical knowledge. There is scientific knowledge of all varieties. There's uh, uh, even a social knowledge like the art of warfare. And there is a Vimana Shastra. If you want to build spaceships, the information is there in the Vedas. Every knowledge is there. So in the Vedas also we find a description of our universe and our solar system and how the things are working. And we find many contradictions between the Vedic description and the current Western understanding of the universe. So from that we have to conclude that there may be many flaws in the understanding of today's astronomers.